What's up, tech fans? Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Microsoft Easy ANZ podcast today. Um, we have got a stacked lineup of topics to get through today, so we will get stuck into that as soon as possible. Um, joining me today from all the way from New Zealand, we have Luke. Um, and then we also have Ali, who is coming to us from Canberra, and our special guest, Master Trainer, today. Now, if you've ever been to a trade show, if you've ever seen an Expert Zone training video, if you've ever seen an Expert Zone stream, you will know the face, you will know the locks, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Nolan. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm like a bad <laughs> smell that doesn't go away, unfortunately. I linger. I'm everywhere. I'm ever present. <laughs> so I thought today to kick things off, we'd do a bit of a recap on the Surface Book 3. Uh, now, we've already talked about this device a fair bit already um, and how it's much more than a laptop. You know, it's not just your basic laptop. It's not just that straightforward laptop form factor. I mean, we do have the Surface Laptop if that's something that you're looking for. Um, but when we're talking Surface Book 3, we're talking more, you know, along those detachable screen devices, two-in-ones, transformers, um, dedicated NVIDIA GPU when it's attached, um, extended battery life when it's attached. Um, and I guess now that it has been in the hands of reviewers um, and some of these big names for the last few weeks, um, we've been able to see the feedback come out and we've been able to see what they think of it, what they like, what they don't like. Um, guys like Linus, Linus had a video, uh, Marcus Brownlee's had a video. Um, Lewis from Unbox Therapy had a really good video as well. Um, and the consensus seems to be overly positive. I mean, it's there's a couple of little nitpicky things that, you know, that were quite common across the board when we're speaking in terms of like what the reviewers thought was a bad thing. Um, and that usually came down to them having issues with the hinge, which I don't really get. I mean, I, I've had the Surface Book 2 since launch, and I love it. I mean, I use it every day. Um, it's my work device. It's my home device. I take it pretty much everywhere with me. Um, and the sticky point of the hinge, I mean, a lot of these guys seem to get hung up on the fact that it does leave that crease where the hinge is and it doesn't close completely flat. Um, for me, it's never been an issue. It's never been a big problem. But I guess for these guys, it's their job to pick out everything you can possibly think of to find the good and the bad. And that was typically what, you know, was a bad thing. I, I've, sp I've spoken about the hinge to customers loads of times. Um, and I th are you talking about the the kind of um, that it's on like a sort of tapered kind of angle? Yeah, yeah, like how it doesn't um, touch perfectly. But, yeah, because I mean the idea behind that is that when you flip the screen, right, you've got like a more comfortable kind of drawing drawing platform, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you when I speak to customers about that and explain it, they're like, oh, okay, it's like a light bulb moment. Like, oh, okay, that that actually makes a lot more sense. Like when you, you know, that's going to be a lot more comfortable position to be using the yeah. pen on the screen. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think also you've got the 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 cooling uh, methodology behind it as well. So if you're using this device to 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 a high specification, if you're using these high powered applications, the device gets warm. And then mm. just by simply closing the screen, you've got a, a warm a warm GPU on a on a screen. That's not necessarily a concoction for a, a great idea. So yeah. having that gap <laughs> as well helps that kind of filter out the uh, the heat and it, let it disperse a lot more evenly when the device is not being used. Yeah. And then of course when it folds out, it balances a lot e uh, a lot easier. So I've kind of sin models that have not ha got that kind of hinge and the way it moves out you try and use the touch screen and it tips the device um so it kind of helps balance that so when somebody is using the touch screen in that laptop form factor it is a lot more sturdy uh, it doesn't mm. feel like the device is going to kind of tip backwards which I i'm sure you guys have experienced on other devices as well when you touch the screen too hard all of a sudden it goes hey! and uh <laughs> you have to bring it back <laughs> yeah yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And and another thing I, that was quite of a, I wouldn't say it was a sticky point, but something that came up with a lot of these guys was when you do detach it, there is that big drop off from a performance point of view. 
But I mean, for me, if I'm if I've got a device like that and I detach it, I'm not going to go and you know start running 3D models or you know yep. doing that sort of thing. When I'm detaching it, I'm more in that content consumption mode, and you know I might be on the couch watching Netflix, you know flicking through the gram, making sure I'm getting the likes, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so that particularly isn't a huge thing for me. I don't know what do you guys think about that. I, I I don't think it's a big problem. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, that that's the way it's intended to be used in clip uh, clipboard mode to be able to draw draw, uh, sketch out or consume any kind of media in a more kind of lighter form factor like you would do on a normal tablet. Uh, I like the fact that now with the Surface Book Three, that you can disconnect it from the GPU when you're using there was something in previous iterations that you might be running PowerPoint, which might be using a little bit of the GPU and you try and disconnect from the screen and it won't allow you disc to disconnect from mm -hmm. that, um, from the bottom because you'll cut, you have to shut down all the programs. Whereas now it's intuitive enough to go, okay, so it's using PowerPoint. It's not using a huge amount of graphics processing. Yeah. I can push that to the onboard processing unit, uh, in, in the clipboard. So when you can take it, it will then allow you to disconnect and take that off. So I think that's actually a, a plus point. And then having that little charging point in the bottom, you know, they didn't have to do that, but it means that you can almost use this device separately from from how it was originally designed to be used as a laptop. Yep. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, Ali, I think I cut you off there before you had something to... Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, my stores have actually received the Book 3 and I've had a good play and feel with it. Um, the instant disconnect is absolutely awesome awesome it I was curious really about that. really disconnects very very quickly um before when you had the you know the light flash once twice while it was actually dis you know getting ready to, to disconnect that doesn't exist mm. anymore it disconnects almost instantly um That's awesome. and and honestly for me personally i really for me I know doubt about the hinge just because of how the electromagnets disconnect and the fact that you do have a graphics card in the bottom that's connected through PCI Express yeah. and you're disconnecting it and you're not having to restart the whole machine. There are mm. very, very few devices that have that ability and you can tell that they've gone through the process of making that viable and quick um, just for user experience and I mm. really appreciate that personally. Yeah. 100%. Mm. So do you think now, you know, is is this the ultimate device for creators? I mean, have we seen enough improvement on the Surface Book 2 considering what Dell's doing with the XPS range? Um, Macs, you know, sorry, Apple's making a bit of noise with the, the MacBook Pro 16. Um, are we still considered now as that, you know, that front of the front of the group in terms of the best device for content creators and the powerhouse, I guess I'd say? Mm-hmm. I mean, look, I think it's a, it's almost like a Swiss Army tool of uh, of a for a for a creative. You know, yeah. it's got it's got something. It's going to do everything in different formats and different ways, and it's got a huge amount of processing power as well. So, from a biased standpoint, and I'm biased because I'm where I've got the badge. I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I use the device. Yeah, it's an it's the ultimate um, device for creators because it's it's packs that power. It's got that amazing battery mm -hmm. life you can it's it's touchscreen uh you can you you can utilize it with pen you don't have to have any kind of third-party products to, to to draw with it it's got it all there and it looks gorgeous as well i'm, I'm yeah. again being biased but it looks stunning <laughs> <laughs> yeah i totally agree i think as well like the the idea of what a what a creative is now is has changed over the last you know in the space yeah. of just the last the last two months um yeah so uh, everybody's got to be creative now. Everyone's got to be a content creator, and they've um, and for somebody to need to go and buy a laptop um, just for the purpose of creating content, um, you know, like this is kind of yeah, it's like a wins everywhere because you've got the power to to create content. You've also got like entertainment device. You've got the opportunity to turn it into like a workstation. You know, run those screens off of it. It's like, a, yeah, like you said, Swiss Army, Swiss Army knife. <laughs> you can do, uh, yeah, it's ideal for everyone. So yeah, definitely, definitely the the, the uh, yeah, definitely doing what it's out there supposed to be doing. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I, I'm I'm similar to to Steve. I'm I'm a fanboy. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, um, I know when the Surface Book Two launched, we had the Microsoft Precision Touchpad drivers, which was it yeah. really set it apart from everyone else. Um, and now those same drivers have sort of filtered into other OEM devices. Mm. Um, is that still, 
you know, can we still say that's our thing and that's what set it apart or is it too close now to the other OEM devices in that, you know, field? I, I like the gestures. I think the gestures are there. But I also think that for, for continuity, let, let's face it, we may have, uh, there may be creatives out there that use a Surface Book for being in their home office, but maybe if they go to another office where they're working, there's other devices that are being used that are Windows devices. If they don't have that same kind of continuity with gestures on the touchpad and things like that, yeah. I think that's a downside. And I think that that's not something that Microsoft is about. We're all about kind of making everything accessible for everybody. I know that we do do things with our first party products that kind of stand out. And we, I, I believe we showcase that technology before then it becomes mainstream. Yeah. And I think that's what we've done with these drivers. We showcased what can be done. And then people who are or OEMs and stuff that were more on the uptake of that want that technology into their devices because that then becomes a new way to interact with their device on another level. And I think that that's where uh where, where we've gone with it um so i mean look it might not necessarily be what i what we would call as like a, a best in class thing anymore mm-hmm. because that is now something that's being done across other oem devices but we were the reason that 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 is now happening we showcased what can be done on, on a touchpad and, and and we've enhanced it and we've you know given that then to oem so i think that's good mm. yeah absolutely and i totally agree with you steve because i think the surface book three really is you know it's one of those devices that's like the perfect all-in-one device. I mean, we have manufacturers now who, you know, they want you to buy the laptop. They want you to buy their tablet. They want you to buy their phone. They want you to buy their watch. And, you know, they're, they're sort of giving it as like that that solution to everything. And, you know, Microsoft's like, oh, oh you want a complete solution? Oh, okay, cool. Let me find... Shabam! And, you know, we get this yeah, exactly. Surface Book 3 that's like... <laughs> Definitely pretty much going to do almost everything you need it to do. Exactly. <laughs> Definitely. So Microsoft Surface Book 3, it's out. Um, it seems to be a big hit. So before we move on, do we have anything else on that topic? Buy it. <laughs> Buy it. Check it out. Yeah. There you have it from Steve. Buy it. <laughs> so over the last couple of months, We've been doing some pretty awesome things behind the scenes in putting together a few how-to videos that go a bit more in-depth with popular Windows features. Steve, Misa, AP, Fletch, and our very talented video editor, Tim Young, have done a fantastic job in putting these together. So let's take a look at one now and find out how you can think with ink. Hi, Andrew here from Microsoft. Working from home can be really frustrating, especially if you've got an unproductive operating system. Fortunately, Windows 10 is here to help. Check out some of our top tips to help you be more productive when you're working from home. When writing with pen and paper and you make a mistake, what do you do? Normally, you'd cross it out. However, when making a mistake on a PC, it isn't always that simple or natural. So now, using inking on Windows 10, you can use different features to be able to make more natural gestures on your device as you would expect to use them. Make a mistake? Just cross it out. Want to remove an entire paragraph? Just scribble it out. You can even make highlighting a document look more professional at the flick of a switch. Inking on Windows 10 is making people interact with technology in a more human way. Pair Windows 10 up with Microsoft 365 and you're on your way to living your best digital life. Okay, (laughs) moving on now. Um, Microsoft Build was last week, I believe, or the week before. Was it last week? Yeah, uh, the week before actually, I think now. yeah, Yeah. Yeah, it was the week before. Time's moving so fast. I know. Um, It was awesome, like it is every other year. Um, Plenty of things to talk about. Plenty of things came up. Um, Build tends to be one of those things where unless you're like the super, super tech guy, nerdy software side of things, it kind of, you know, goes above the head a bit, Um, which I I, that that's kind of me sometimes, even though I geek out on anything. So I, I still watch it every year. Um, one of the big things for me that came out of build was the Microsoft supercomputer. I don't know if you guys caught that and you know what that was all about, but they've basically built 
uh, one of the top five publicly disclosed supercomputers in the world. And they have done this in conjunction with OpenAI. Um, and again, I don't know if you guys remember last year, Microsoft announced that partnership with OpenAI, I think it was mid last year, working on you know machine learning and all things AI and that sort of thing. Uh, well, this was built basically exclusively for them. So it's not something that's for sale. Um, and it will be hosted on the Azure Public Cloud. Um, and they've been working pretty closely together to work on some pretty awesome models. Um, and it sort of ties in with Microsoft's very strong commitment to all kinds of research in the general purpose AI field. Mm. I mean, this thing has 285,000 CPU cores, um, 10,000 <laughs> GPUs, and it will operate at over 400 gigabits per second of network connectivity for each GPU in the cluster. When I saw that, I was like, That's insane. What? Mm. Absolutely bananas. <laughs> um, that is mad. And Microsoft <laughs> has learned a lot um, by using Azure in these sort of high performance scenarios. Mm. Um, they've learned what it means to run AI models at that ridiculous scale. Um, and in doing so, we have now seen the benefits of these modeling or this like this modeling feed its way down into things like Microsoft Office. Um, they even mm. spoke about it at Build. Um, so in other words, the AI you're seeing in Microsoft Office today has been improved and implemented because of the work achieved by the supercomputer. Mm. Um, so in yeah. a way, we kind of all benefit indirectly. Um, yeah. What do you guys think? It's pretty sick. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, getting your yeah. head around those numbers. Isn't I know. Yeah. 285,000 like, CPU cores and 10,000 GPUs. Yeah, I mean, my, like, my brain can't fathom <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, like that amount of power. But um, no, I I uh, I've read a little bit into it. I think my main kind of takeaway that I think a lot of people should really kind of focus on in this. Uh, they they had this analogy that it's very similar to the way that um, like automotive technology advances. So they they do it in high end racing. They put all of the kind of um, advances into high end. And then it's like a consumer market and i think that's that's going to be the big kind of benefits for for consumer market like everything that's coming on like leaps and bounds with supercomputer with ai with uh, cloud computing is going to trickle down to the the consumer market and we're going to get a better experience um yeah across across everything so yeah it's definitely really cool really exciting stuff mm. it seems like something that would be quite up your alley Ali, sorry, I really didn't mean to do that then. <laughs> oh, my days. Um, I think I'm going to give you a 4 out of 10 for that joke. I legitimately <laughs> didn't mean to do that then. <laughs> but I've heard Ali talk about this sort of thing on our previous episode, so I'm interested to hear what you think. Look, uh, I really appreciate the... Uh, again, it's all about the trickle-down the trickle down effect, right? Uh, I'm a personally a big fan of the Formula One, and you, you do see that trickle-down technology go down from the race cars into real-world cars over time. And the fact that, you know, as a company, Microsoft is doing that higher-level kind of enterprise-grade stuff that is kind of out of our imagination or our comprehension of what it can do and what it can achieve, the, its effects are still, still trickling down to stuff like office. Yeah, uh, that that's the big takeaway for me, and that's what I really appreciate. It's the fact that there is a vision forward, and yep. the fact it is coming down to us. It's not something that's exclusive to the enterprise and commercial grade, you know, clients. That's what I really appreciate about it more than anything. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm. And for me too, like, let me pitch it to you this way: with machine learning and AI quickly becoming, you know, the focus for companies like Microsoft and like these other big players in that sort of AI field. I'm interested to hear from you guys about what areas in life we should be looking at next in order to advance it to the next level. Like where can we use AI in this sort of technology next? Steve's smiling, so I think he's got something coming up. <laughs> I've got a massive opinion on Steve, this. Steve, Steve <laughs> was giving us some thoughts. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was talking to my wife about this the other day, um, and it, it stemmed from a conversation about buying houses um, and the way that you kind of pick out certain features within your house. Do you want to raise the ceilings? Do you want to have special shiny taps? 
um, and, and door and what kind of doorknobs do you want? Like but <laughs> the way that I think the world is going and the way that I or the way that I want it to go is that actually when you're building your home now, you start to build in these smart features within your home mm-hmm. that then uses that machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I've been lucky enough to go to places like ces where they showcase this kind of technology and uh a brand that do this really really well particularly at ces is samsung um but the the whole kind of the the way what i want to see is this kind of smart home really start integrating in so yes my alarm goes off at seven o'clock in the morning uh, if i'm lucky and my daughter doesn't wake me up before but it starts to learn what your patterns are, what your movements are. And then my coffee machine makes me a coffee as soon as I wake up. Like, it's like this. Have you seen that scene from Wallace and Gromit where he has, like, his alarm goes off and it automatically puts the toast in the toaster, yeah. pops it up, yeah. and then butter gets thrown at it? Like, I want that, but I want my my computer my supercomputer my my artificial intelligence to to learn what i do when i do it and my routines yeah. and then predict where i'm going what i'm doing and what i'm going to need like right it's already kind of there at a, a small level now where it my phone knows that it's a sunday so i don't go to work but on a monday it will say hey it's going to take you 45 minutes to get to the office today at this time so you need to leave now um so it already kind of starts to learn your how you do things but it's very kind of regimented and how you set that i want it to be able to learn more creatively and then what we do is when we start to build these houses we build our smart homes systems into this maybe different companies build these different smart home things to work for how you want to be as a family how you want your home to interact with you so yeah i think it's pretty cool that's how i want it and that that is my my like utopian future is when I get to build a house and get to build like a, a, a an artificial intelligent being that lives in my house, learns what my family does, and predicts our movements. Yeah. Very Tony Stark like. <laughs> See, that's interesting. You you mentioned like houses and like real estate. Uh, the the area I really interested in, hopefully shifting to, is actually automotive. So, for example, I I ride motorbikes and there's just little stuff which I feel like artificial intelligence could just touch and would just make the whole just alter the whole transport industry change. And one that comes to mind is, for example, when you when you're when you're driving on the roads, motorbike car, you there are little things you notice. So, for example, you often see people before they merge lanes, before they indicate to merge lanes, they'll start shifting. So uh, where I can see it happening is, for example, in my motorbike helmet, there's almost like a little indicator when if a car starts shifting, um, you know, almost wanting to move over but hasn't necessarily indicated yet, there's almost an indication of that of, you know, caution, be wary, whatever it might be, a little, like a little heads up display. There, as far as I know, there's nothing like that really in existence at the moment, but that would be really interesting in like reducing fatalities um, mm. and that sort of thing. Mm. That's really mm. cool. I like mm. the idea of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's definitely something you pick up as a driver. You you see people start shifting before they've necessarily indicated. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, so if the technology can almost give you or almost provoke you to oh okay, I, it's noticed that as well. I'll tap the brakes and you know give yeah. them some space or whatever it might be. Yeah. I, I I would really really like to see it kind of emerge in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And as crazy and as powerful as these are these things are now it seems like we're literally just scratching the surface and we're just starting to find out you know how far we can really go with this um Mm -hmm. they they elaborated it on it a fair bit at build um and they had a few examples where you know these 3d models and machine learning platforms are basically consuming billions of pages of data from the internet and then they're sort of throwing you know, different scenarios at it and saying, seeing how quickly they can solve it, um, how, if they can alter certain patterns so they can sort of change the trajectory of what they need to do. Um, it was it was mind boggling. I couldn't mm-hmm. believe it. I mean, I, 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 as I said, I'm a bit of a tech guy and I, I geek out on that sort of thing, but that went way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, supercomputer, it seems to be a thing of the future now. So 
Keep an eye on it. Make my smart home. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, moving on now, we have an interesting topic here. Um, Australian government cloud contracts. Mm. Um, I don't know if you guys have been following this or keeping an eye on this sort of thing, but it is pretty interesting to see. So basically what we have here in Australia is the, the DTA, or the, uh, which is the Digital Transformation Agency. And they are now on the hunt for several providers to join what they're now calling a new platform, and it's called the Cloud Marketplace. Um, so this will replace uh, the CSP, which is the Cloud Services Panel, and I think we've had that in place since uh, early 2015, um, and that contract was set to expire in early 2021. Now, when the Australian government put out the tender for offers, they were hoping to have this all sort of tied up between before the end of July, obviously with everything happening now with COVID and, you know, that sort of whole dilemma. Um, everything's been pushed back to next year now. Um, and the current contract consists of, you know, the usual big names. So we've got uh, AWS from Amazon, Microsoft's there, Cisco, IBM. Um, I think all up it was 200 plus different vendors that are currently on that contract. Um, and for this new one, you basically have to tender your new offer. So it's not like it's just going to roll over to everyone and then, you know, everyone can be a part of the new platform. Um, mm. And then you also have to go through like different certifications. An interesting one there for me was that you to be a or to be accepted for this new cloud marketplace, you have to prove that your cloud services are locally hosted here in Australia, or like through a third party here in Australia. If your company isn't based mm-hmm. here in Australia, um, mm-hmm. the topic of you know cloud contracts for government it it seems to be a I don't know. I didn't think I'd ever say this, but it's quite a drama-filled topic at the moment. Um, <laughs> everything sort of kicked off, you know, with the, I guess the big one was the the Jedi contract, which was up for sale or up for, you know, to win last year, I believe. Uh, the two big players there were Microsoft and Amazon. Um, it was said that Amazon had it pretty much well wrapped up because they have close ties with the US government at the moment. So it figured, you know, they figured it would just be a, you know, a simple transition there. But out of nowhere, Microsoft came and won that race and won the contract. I believe it's $10 billion over 10 years, I think. So billion, so it's quite a, you know, it's a big contract. Um, And that sort of didn't sit well with Amazon and it stored it stirred up a few, you know, not so nice exchanges between the two parties, I guess. Mm. Um, (laughs) But on that topic of, you know, cloud computing and it's all tying in with AI and that sort of thing, with so many businesses now and even government agencies moving operations to the cloud, what type of risks are associated with that sort of thing? Because, you know, if it it seems like if you're an old school type person, you'd be like, oh, what's the cloud? I can't see the cloud. You know, that sort of mindset. So I know I'm interested to hear what you guys think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think this, like everything that you've just spoken about there, it just highlights how important cloud computing is and how important it's going to be in in the future that it's, you know, you've got um, these kind of like battles going on for, um, for, uh, yeah, for contracts and stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely, it's going to be, it's the future of of computing, definitely. Um, But I think, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what, I think the biggest thing with the biggest kind of setback to cloud computing is getting the average person to really understand what it is. Yeah. I think like I even come up against this just talking about OneDrive with <laughs> with the average person in the street. Like they don't understand mm. what OneDrive is. They don't understand how it works that, or, you know, I think that's, that's the real, the real problem. And to get, mm. um, even if, um, you know, it has all of its advantages and it's going to be advantage. It's going to be uh, beneficial to every, every business, just kind of explaining to every business how it's going to be beneficial. is going to be the big challenge, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head as well. And remembering as well that those people that we talk to on the street about, you know, even if it's at a granular level to do with OneDrive, um, they're the same people 
that are going into these large businesses that working at these large businesses government organizations you know would be would be really silly to think that they put on their suit on a monday morning walk into their government uh government owned building and uh know exactly what cloud computing is they're exactly the same people <laughs> that have no idea what cloud computing is outside of work mm. um so it's making sure that people understand that and the, what we found is that i've gone to kind of i've been at events where i've spoken about you know the dangers of what OneDrive could produce, like having your photos stored in the cloud. And mm-hmm. then I've gone to large uh, business business expos and stuff like that, where I'm talking to business owners who are saying, oh, yeah, but all my data stored in the cloud, isn't that really, really unsafe? Like, it's, it's the same question. It's the same conversation that you're having with people at a smaller level than you are at a larger level. Yeah. And I think that where, like, government agencies transferring their businesses onto into cloud is really, it, it's a, first of all, like just to cloud computing in general, regardless of the company, that's a huge testimony to how secure and safe cloud Absolutely. computing is. Mm. Um, because you've got governments that are, I mean, I, I, I fail to see any other per, any other body that would have more sensitive information than governments, uh, yeah. different, different areas <laughs> of government. So, I mean, if you think that your business has got more sensitive data than, than what some of the governments are, are, are hosting, I, I challenge that. Um, <laughs> um, so looking at that, I mean, that is really, really great for cloud computing. Uh, risks associated with it, I mean, look, that I, I believe they're minimal. I'm a big believer in cloud computing. I'm a big believer that all the security protocols that are put in place are put in place for a reason. Yeah. Is it 100% foolproof? Well, like we, we've seen in the past that different companies have different areas that they that they may be exposed on. Moving this towards a Microsoft standpoint, we are yet to have any kind of uh, security breaches when it comes to Azure. Uh, when it comes to to things like that. And I think that we put in a lot of security measures and we have a lot of technology put in place to make sure that things are safe. Um, But then you've also got what we class as a hybrid model. And and I'm sure that you guys will be aware of what a hybrid model is. But um, when where there are particularly sensitive documents that really businesses or organizations are, are dead set worried that if that goes into the cloud they're going to get stolen and i understand that banks are very very much like this um then they can host part of their database on premises so they can have that data stored where they need it and then the rest of the data they can have stored in the cloud and then you've got the the conversation to go with well, when we say that data stored in the cloud does it leave australia where is that hosted because there are another there are other organizations and companies that can't have data stored in another country yeah that it's that is sensitive to 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 the country that they're in so there's lots of different ways and different there's ways around it and there's ways to kind of to mitigate those circumstances um but you also want to make sure that if you do store your data in the cloud that if one server does go down you're still going to be able to access your data it's backed up it's somewhere else yeah. um so there's there's lots of different ways to work around it but I, I i believe that right now we're in this kind of hybrid stage where people are starting to come around to cloud computing they're still not a hundred percent convinced they're still a little bit worried that if we were on a on a very low down level, they're still a little bit worried that their nudes are going to be leaked from their <laughs> from their phone. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but they uh, they're starting oh, no, to come around. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm sure you have a hybrid system there, Luke. <laughs> Got to have on site backup. Mm. <laughs> so yeah i mean i'm a big believer in cloud computing i think it's the uh, it, will, it is the way of the future it is the way that things will go um there is only so much infrastructure that you can have as a as a business as an organization that then, then you're limited whereas yep. with cloud computing with azure with any other company it's limitless computing power yes absolutely mm. and it's yeah. scalable scalable as well yes absolutely 100 mm. percent yeah, what um, I was just going to say at the at the very very like fundamental level of this, it's a cost benefit analysis between key, you know the having the physical good point uh, having having it physically with you, or you know on a cloud server you know offsite, right? Um, as as most of us will know, governments tend to be very very late adopters of technologies. They don't tend to adopt anything until what? it's been no. proven, and yeah. <laughs> until it's been well well proven, and often long time after that, just because of the bureaucracy. Um, it it's been proven in the private sector, um, and now the government 
looking into um, like cloud services for the, for all their um, you know important documents and files. Obviously, that cost benefit analysis shows that the benefits outweigh the risk. And if they if at the government level they see that, then it to me it's almost a, a form of validation. Absolutely, mm. that's mm. a great point. I mm. think I know the answer to this question, but it was sort of pitched to me by one of the RSPs when I brought up this topic of what we're going to talk about. And the question <laughs> is, if either of us or either of you guys had a business, would you be comfortable, you know, having the majority of your business's information in the cloud? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think it's the it's the best way to go for whether you're a small business, medium business, large business, because it is scalable. Maybe you are a small business, but maybe you'll become a large business. Yeah. Um, and it's scalable cost infrastructure. You don't you don't have to pay for maintenance of, of, of hardware. This is it's I, I said the way forward It is 100 percent. If I was smart enough to run a business, I would run it in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's uh, it's a case of. You know, everybody's every business is pretty much using it already, whether they they're kind of aware of it or not. And it's that thing of actually really understanding what it is. I mean, if you've got a website on Squarespace, it's hosted on the cloud. Yeah. You know, if it, if you have a you know um, if you're um, I don't know using you know even like Netflix, so all, mm-hmm. all hosted on the cloud. All the you know all the software that's built for companies, loads of it's built built on the yep. cloud. Um, so yeah, I definitely would. Yeah, yeah, without doubt. I mean, even even to to go as small as uploading that picture to Facebook of your mm. cat. Yep. Yeah. That that's not hosted on your computer. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just about to say that. Like, if <laughs> as like a, a way of breaking it down to people, you could always use examples of you know this is you're you're using cloud computing now when you do things like that. Like Steve said, mm. uploading your photos and mm. you know storing things in OneDrive. So I think you're yeah, absolutely I mean, right. Yeah. Social media. All social media. It's all uh, yeah. Cool. Well, it looks like it's a consensus yes to cloud computing. <laughs> yeah. It's all good, guys. You can go ahead. You've, you've yeah, got the tick from we've, we've got four amateur podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> Big thumbs up from us. Do it. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> okay, up next, stay home. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey has reached out to many of his employees and given them the news that they will no longer be required to work from the office. Um, They'll now be working permanently from home. Um, Obviously, this is not for everyone. There are going to be certain jobs where you do need to come into the office, um, like the cleaners, um, you know, if you're maintaining servers, that sort of thing. Obviously, you're still going to be required to show up. Um, but I read through the statement that their uh, human resources head put out and um, I believe her name was Jennifer Christie. And she said that prior to the whole pandemic going down, uh, Twitter was kind of moving towards that, you know, distributed work from home style anyway. Um, they were about to roll out a similar plan and this sort of just kicked things into overdrive. And yeah, it seems like now the majority of the company will be working from home. Um, I know that has impacted us pretty greatly here at Microsoft. Um, Most of us, well, all of us, um, basically have been working at home for the last couple of months. Um, Mm. Having that experience on our side, like we've literally lived it, um, how has this impacted your daily life? Um, And do you think, could we, you know, could we implement this moving forward or is this just sort of like a temporary thing where you know we just did it to get past this epidemic and now things should just go back to normal yeah look i i i can i see things from different from from two different sides of the coin because when i started working at microsoft uh my boss who who hired me his exact words to me were i don't care where you are when you're working yeah um i i don't care whether you're on on the beach, whether you are in a cafe or whether you're at home or you're in the office, as long as the work gets done and that needs to get done, it, it's not a, not a question. Um, and taking that a step further, uh, when my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago, um, I was had to go back to the UK. Uh, all my family are based in the UK. And um, I was able to work for two and a half weeks whilst I kind of got my granddad's affairs in order and, and, and sorted all the stuff out in the UK. I was able to work. 
And it wasn't an issue for anybody. And it's that kind of acceptance that means that there's so many different benefits to allowing your employees that uh, flexibility to work where they feel most productive. Um, whether that is being able to leave the office at one o'clock to go and do the school run and then coming home and being able to finish off, or whether that literally means that that person who's just had a baby and doesn't necessarily want to to, to leave, uh, come back to work after three months, they can still work from home and be with their child. I mean, that was one of the most upsetting things, I think, for some parents is that they, they, they have a child and they're off for three months with, with their child bonding, and then they're like, okay, see you later i'm now got to go away for eight hours after you've spent three months with this thing that you have made it's yours you've created yeah. this like, have you? <laughs> so i think that there's i mean there's science behind the amount of sick days that people take when they have the flexibility to be able to work from home i cannot remember the last time i called up my boss and said hey i'm sick i'm not working today because if i'm sick there's nothing stopping me from putting on my Ugg boots, sitting in my dressing gown on the couch over there and doing, going through my emails and doing work from there. Yeah. And I, I don't, and you still get productivity out of people when they're sick. Whereas if it was in an office, you wouldn't get any productivity out of somebody. If they said, sorry, I'm sick, I'm not coming in. Um, that's it. Their computer's off. They're not doing emails. They're sitting and watching Netflix. Whereas you give them the opportunity to be able to work from home when they are sick, when they are feeling under the weather, they still have that means of communication. That is their norm for them. Um, and I think that I think this, the science behind the amount of sick days that people take when they can work from home or work from where, where they have that flexible uh, kind of environment is huge. Mm. Now, moving into this pandemic and meaning that people kind of have now been forced to work from home. I think it's been a really, really good thing for everybody's skill sets because what it's done is it's forced people yeah, to pivot on how they interact with their audience, however, whoever that audience is. Uh, for for I know for a lot of, a lot of us, our, our, our audience are retail professionals, are people that work within stores, and in in some countries like Luke, I know yourself that, that you you went into full lockdown. Where, so retail shut and you were unable to interact with your retail pros. You couldn't go into store. I know here in Australia that we weren't allowed to, to, to enter stores um, to provide any kind of training material. In doing that, we had a huge release of new Surface products um, and an announcement and, and, you know, different things were supposed to kind of be happening during this time. Uh, how do we kind of pivot to change what our material is to still kind of make ourselves relevant? And I think that uh, us as as a team, you know, cohesively have worked together to make to make our stuff online and virtual and and appealing, mm -hmm. and I think that that is a great skill set to learn moving forwards because you now know that you don't just have to walk into somebody's store and say hello, Mister Salesperson, yeah. listen to me talk for five minutes. Um, you can do it in much more kind of uh, adaptive, engaging mm -hmm. ways. That necessarily don't mean that you have to leave your house and that can be done so i think it's huge i think it's great um if, if we look at positives to come out of this pandemic and there are not a lot uh, <laughs> but if we look at some forms of positives i think that people have learned new skill sets in their in their ways of employment to be able to make themselves more adaptable to different situations and still showcase that they can provide value in their area of expertise so i think that yeah that whole model is here to, I think it's pushed people to kind of move that way. And you might find now the businesses that were like, no, you need to come into the office on Monday. That's when we have our meetings. Might be more flexible from saying that, hey, Mondays are a bit of a naff day for everyone. No one likes Mondays. Why don't we stay at home and have our calls on, on, on Teams or Zoom or Skype, whatever you want to use. Why not do that? And I think you might start to feel that See, see that that happens a bit more. I've just spoken a lot. I'm really sorry I've talked. <laughs> no, no, that's amazing. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I like that point um, before, sorry, before I sort of flip over to Luke and Ali, that you made a good point. Um, myself being in store the last few days, I actually interacted with a few of the guys and even some of the, you know, the proprietors and the managers and the, and like laughingly the, the topic came up of you guys should just do that all the time. And I was like, ah, Ooh, you got me there. I was like, Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it just shows that, you know, we sort of had to, think on the spot there of ways to be effective and it actually turned out to be quite effective. So 
Yeah. I mean, I think we did an amazing job. I just want to put that out there. I think as a team, I think we did really yeah. well. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I'm really proud of the team that I work with, um, you know, to, to have made that pivot to working from home to lockdown life, however you want to kind of call mm. it. This digi- it's, it's, almost, it's a mini digital transformation in itself. Um, because you have now transitioned fully digital rather than just being maybe that hybrid that we spoke about in previous yeah. in, in the previous kind of segment, you're fully like digital yeah. and you've had to make that work. Yeah. And everybody from what I've seen has, has made it work to their advantage. Uh, and it's testimony to kind of how everyone's kind of come out of this now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Honestly, the, the thing that's really amazed me is the idea of the of almost international HR management because I mean just us here we're talking from what two or three different time zones we're all together mm-hmm. we're all we're all interacting we're we're hosting this podcast and we have that ability that 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 is what I find interesting because it means that you truly can have the best person for the role do doing that role even if they are cross borders cross time mm-hmm. zones whatever it might be. I mean, I know when I was my, contacting my stores, I wasn't just contacting my own stores, I was contacting stores all over the state and all over the East Coast. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the fact that, you know, all four of us can be here despite the different time zones to talk about this technology. And it's, you know, where it's been enabled by you know teams by skype by whatever format you are using yeah i couldn't agree more <clears throat> absolutely a short time ago i thought i would head out into the field and spend some time with our retail partners just to sort of get a a feel for how they were going during that lockdown period to see you know how sales were going is everything going better is it going worse uh, and just in general how it affected them and on this particular day, I caught up with Michael and I just sort of wanted to get an insight from him into how his sales were going, you know, on the surface front um, and just with Microsoft in general and, and even Xbox. And here's what he had to say. Look, I feel very fortunate to be at JB. We've been, um, since everything's gone down, it's, uh, I've certainly noticed an increase in sales or at least buyers through the door. Anyone that's walking in isn't shopping, they're buying. Uh, setting up home office, uh, homeschooling, um, yeah, anything from laptops and desktops, uh, monitors to plug in. So uh, very fortunate to be able to uh, sell as much as we can and what we have left as well. Uh, Surface Laptop 2. Uh, I've got a really good price and I really like the matte black and I do like the black Alcantara as well. But I bought it because I bought a new camera and I wanted to do some uh, photo edits and with their high resolution screen uh, and obviously thin, lightweight and portable so I do a lot of travelling with it so it's been really good lately, I've been enjoying it. Um, it's i5, 8 gig, 256 which is more than enough for Lightroom and Photoshop for me so it's been great. My last laptop was a MacBook Pro, um, but um, because I've got into PC gaming maybe like three years ago now, um, been using Windows 10 um, since I did that build. Um, so yeah, it's been a fine transition. Um, but everything's great, lightweight, great battery life. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah, look, time management is definitely a thing doing um, working full time and coming home and having to, uh, we're well not having to, to stream or anything, but uh, finding time to do it can be a bit of an effort sometimes. Streaming has taken a little bit of a backseat since the photography started, uh, but looking to maybe do some more unboxing videos and stuff soon. Um, just a different creative journey, so, but no. Juggling streaming with full time can be a little tricky, but it's always fun when you get it done. Yeah, look, everyone likes a little bit of mystery out there. Uh, so yeah, when I, when I started, I decided to stream as a silhouette. Um, no one knew what I looked like. I actually went to a Twitch meetup 
and obviously no one knew who I was because there was no visible uh, picture of me anywhere. Uh, and then yeah, put together this big hype reveal video, which for someone that was so new to Twitch, blew up massively. We got plenty of raids, lots of hosts, and a lot of viewers just for this little reveal video, uh, which was a super high quality. I'm sure you'll have a clip of it somewhere. Uh, but that was a lot of fun. Yeah, so current setup is uh, uh, pretty glamorous actually. I'm really hands-on and I really like custom-built sort of stuff. So as for my PCs, I actually run two PCs. One's a gaming PC, the secondary is a streaming PC. Um, both running Windows 10 Pro. Uh, the gaming PC is a i7, uh, 16 gig of RAM, um, and I use um, M.2 SSDs in there as well, uh, and a GTX 1080 Ti. Uh, that's the gaming PC. Uh, the secondary actually uses a Ryzen processor, I believe it's a 1600, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, um, and a GTX 1080 in there as well. Um, I just do that because some games are really heavy on a gaming PC and when you're running a recording software like OBS sometimes that can be a little bit heavy. So I can run a game at its full potential on my gaming PC and then just use the streaming PC to pick up that, the rest of the bits and put it out onto the web. It's a bit of a setup but I, I quite like it. games we're playing at the moment, why I'm playing at the moment is Apex Legends. I have a small addiction to that at the moment. I, I do generally like fast paced games. Um, so yeah, that, that caught my attention straight away because I used to play a lot of Titanfall 2. Um, I used to play a lot of Overwatch as well, uh, which is really fun. I do like that strategy of that, of team play. Um, I try not to get too emotional in those games, but sometimes you don't really have a choice. Uh, but yeah, those sort of one. I want to give Warzone a go. I downloaded it. I haven't played it just yet, but that definitely tickles my fancy as well. So pretty much a lot of FPS games is, is, is what I like. I was a big fan of um, Sea of Thieves. Uh, getting on and playing with friends is just like so much fun. Uh, and they're keeping it constantly up to date with all different stuff. Visually, I really like the game and you can play it if you want to just have an action pack game or even one time I played to like 4am just with a friend just chatting all night and just cruising and getting treasure so it can be pretty fun. Oof. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I probably would like them to revisit some sort of like in-ear headset something that's small, light, and convenient. Convenience is such a big thing nowadays. You can have a really nice sounding headset, but if it's something that's not convenient, I feel like people, uh, people lean more towards that convenience over maybe sound and something like that. Maybe getting into smart home stuff, um, whether it's lighting or PowerPoints, but like we're, we're all headed that way of having that full home network you know, set up. So I think if they put a bit of, resource into that that might be cool because they do they do if they did it they do probably the best job at it so all right moving on now we have um some big news there's been a few of the big players in the oems releasing devices over the last few months um the most popular especially with rsps from what i've heard um and you know the feedback i get from them is the new xps range um, and also the Razer 17 inch, which from a specs perspective looks like to be an absolute beast. Um, 17 inch, 300 hertz screen, um, <laughs> and with a hefty price tag as well. Um, we'll have a look at that shortly. Um, but I guess we'll kick the topic off with the XPS range. Um, the XPS 15 seems to be doing awesome things. Um, the reviewers love it. I've seen quite a few videos from, you know, Unbox Therapy, Marcus Brownlee again. Um, it seems to be quite a favourite with them. Um, what have you guys heard about these devices and are you hearing good things, you know, around your circles as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm in love with, with I, I've always loved Dell and I think sometimes they've got a bit of a bad rap in the past. Um, but I have been a Dell fan since... Oh, 
my gosh we look we're going back 15 16 17 years now uh, my, one of my first computers was a dell um like, but i love how they innovate i love how their computers look um i love that almost bezel-less display i yeah. just just that, everything mm. about dell that's been a big selling good. point is they've that the xps had traditionally small bezels anyway and apparently they've gotten smaller mm. again <laughs> yeah I, I totally agree steve like i've I've got a Dell laptop um, and it's had it for a couple of years. Um, it's still, yeah, going fine. It's no, no problem with it. And yeah, I'm the same. I was, uh, I think Dell was one of the first laptops I got like maybe yeah, 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. I think at, at the time you couldn't buy them through retail stores. You had to buy them through I was literally just website. about to say that, yeah. Because yeah, like that is their advertisement. Like, obviously you're from the UK as well. So this was a lot of the adverts that you saw about Dell was that you can't buy Dell in a store. And yeah. it kind of annoyed me that I really wanted one and had to wait two weeks for delivery, but it was yeah. so <laughs> worth it. <laughs> but you had to pick mm. like all the specs, right? You had to go yeah. through each, yeah, each, each <laughs> spec and pick it out and build it. Yeah. 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 But, and, but, and I agree as well, like it kind of, they kind of got like a bit of a bad rap or kind of maybe just dropped down a little bit in people's sort of expectations. And then, when the XPS came out, it was like, oh no, we're still here. Like we're, you know, we're, we're still creating <laughs> we're amazing modern devices. Yeah. <laughs> and I know from my time in retail as well, one of the big selling points for Dell was they have a really good warranty. Um, so mm. you could buy a Dell device and, you know, if you've had it for six months, three months, whatever, um, if you've had an issue with it, they would have next day on-site warranty. So someone would mm. come out to you and, have a look at it. If they if they can fix it on the spot, they will. If it needs to be replaced, then you'll get it replaced. So that was always a, a big thing for them. Um, I'm mm. not too sure, but I think quite a few other OEMs are doing that now too. I think HP do that as well. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, one thing I've always appreciated about Dell and the XPS series is just their customizability. It's you can really, really get exactly what you want. Yeah, yeah. And unlike uh, unlike other brands, you can go onto the website, you can order the exact specification you'll want. And a lot of the time, they're pretty easy to upgrade later on down the line. You know, in a few years time when you need that bigger SSD or some, you know, 32 mm. gig RAM, um, you, it is possible to do unlike other devices. So mm. th I do yeah. appreciate that with Dell. I think you. Are, I've just, I'm just reading on this uh, this page as well. It's like, so the maximum memory that's going to be available is 64 gig, but it can be topped up with configurations that can come with as many as four two terabyte SSDs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh my gosh! <laughs> like, if you've got someone that's worried about storing their nudes in the cloud, that <laughs> device for uh, <laughs> that's a device for you. Luke. Yeah. <laughs> and again, like reflecting back on my time in retail, um, you're absolutely right, Ellie. The, they call it a BTO. Um, it's it's really big and popular with the the retailers because they know like a customer can come in, you know, if there's nothing there that they want, you can literally spec it out to exactly how they want and have it sent out. So you're right, it's a it's a big thing. Mm, 100%. Now moving on to the Razorblade Pro 17. Um, this thing is an absolute beast. 17-inch display. Um, I'm just going through the specs here. I guess the the scary thing for me is the price tag. Um, <laughs> I'm just I'm just looking at the website now, and it's at six one nine nine. Three hundred hertz display, full HD gaming, five hundred and twelve gig SSD, and an RTX twenty eighty super. Yeah, but look at yeah. it. That's a beast. It's amazing. It looks it looks yeah. stunning. The fact that you've now got uh, a touch, you've got a touch screen on a gaming device as well. It's running at 4K, like that. That's a big deal. And in the size screen that it's running at, 17 inches as well. Yeah. Mm. Like, that's I, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Razer. I, lo I love what they do. Um, mm. Haven't always come to Australia with their devices um, in, for, for for full retail. Um, so it's been one of those devices that. I've kind of admired from afar because there's not many people in the country that have them. Yeah. Mm. Are we hearing much from our retail partners about this device? Like, is it is it gaining traction or? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. 
Uh, it's not it's not something that I kind of get any kind of visibility into. It would be great if it was, um, yeah. because it means I, th I think a big a big part of these of spending this amount of money on devices is, is getting the device to kind of be seen and 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 mm -hmm. trying before you buy. I mean, look, you can't obviously full game out in in, in a retail store, <laughs> but just seeing the device, appreciating it, and and seeing the value before you part with six and a half grand of your hard-earned cash mm. <laughs> um, is a big thing. Yeah. Well, I know for a fact um, my my big major store, which is um, JB Hi-Fi Canberra City, they do stock certain Razer models. And I know the Microsoft store down in Sydney also stocks the Razer Blade Stealth, the 13-inch. Mm. Um, uh, but up here, um, we, we do have the Pro Advanced, and from memory was a – i7 16512 with like um, a 2070, which is still a very, good. very, mm. very good system. It is stocked and it does sell. It, it It's one of those Halo kind of computers. It's one of the where if someone wants the best of the best, that's what you show them. And a lot mm. of people appreciate that. That's why you have people buying luxury sports cars. That's why you have people buying the, you yeah. know, mega mansions. Yeah. They do sell. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, moving on now. I'm probably going to cop a bit of flack for this one because I am a Microsoft fanboy. However, <laughs> I believe it was last week we had the 30-year anniversary of Microsoft Solitaire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> I never really got into Solitaire, so when it came up, I was like, oh, 30 years, wow. Um, Save that big news for last. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, this was kind of on your viewpoint, I guess, Luke. So what, what's the go with 30 years of Microsoft Solitaire? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I think it's, it's got like a cult following, right? It has, like a it cult reputation, has. just Solitaire on a, on a screen. It's like the, um, it's the, uh, the kind of view, you know, you see it in like TV shows when the, there's like someone in a space station that's, you know, skiving off work and they're playing solitaire on their computer. Yeah. Um, I, and I think um, it was the, the really interesting thing about solitaire as well is that it was, uh, I think it was designed to show off drag and drop. Yeah. Um, ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Is that right? yeah. I yeah, did well, not know so, that. Um, yeah. So it's, it's got like a nice little history to it as well. Um, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Great game. <laughs> yeah, everybody's played everyone's played solitaire right um yeah and uh, i thought it was definitely worth a mention 30 years of uh of microsoft solitaire 30 years yeah. of solitaire it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's got a bit of history in there like i'm 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 33 so technically haven't really known a computer to not have solitaire on it and it's uh it is one of those quintessential boredom games that everyone will have bought up at some point once they've cracked how to beat the largest minesweeper. Um, <laughs> like the next thing to move on to would be uh, would be solitaire, and I, I mean, I'm not smart enough to be able to understand the different iterations of, of solitaire, but I know that uh, being able to play it and the best best part about the entire game is when you complete it and all the cars go. <laughs> all <that laughs> best part. Best part. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping on that game news, I don't know if you guys saw this last week or it might have been earlier this week actually, but um, NVIDIA has basically managed to recreate a Pac-Man game by feeding the video into an AI model and by watching the game, the AI model recreated the game. Wow. When I saw that, I, I was have, like, I wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. It it's recreated amazing. it by, by watching it. Well, yeah, that, so that, that absolutely the, blew my mind. So I don't know if you guys saw that story. Like, I think when, when I saw first saw the story, oh, that's cool. Like, it, you know, like AI, AI does it again. And then yeah. <laughs> I kind of read the story and I, and I was like, actually, you know, this is uh, incredible. Like, this is, this is actually really cool. Um, and then I read uh, a couple of articles about it and stuff, and they're saying, um, you know, like when you, it kind of takes it to the next level when you think of what this can actually do for gaming. Um, so there, you know, there's uh, reports of it being, you could use it to 
um, feed in information of a game that you're developing and it can actually help you build like you know other levels other challenges yeah. other stories um, and it's just going to make the actual uh, the process of building games a lot easier um, and uh, it could also be used for um, there was a, another section about uh, pro uh, using it to like program robots so for example if you have like a um, like a warehouse where there's uh, robots that are moving stock around or picking up stock for deliveries etc uh, this model would actually be able to see how the robots are moving, um, seeing what information they're reacting to, and then even like program other robots to work sort of in unison with these. So it would take out a lot of um, a lot of time for people to actually sort of program these things themselves. Mm. So that I think that kind of takes it to the to the next level. Like seeing that it's just built Pac-Man just by watching it is is awesome. But then when you see it in like a real world situation, yeah, it's yeah. like okay, this is this is pretty cool. And there's no coding. It's all visual. Yeah, it's all so visual. No code. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of goes back to that like... that AI topic we were talking about, where we're like, where yeah. where do we go next? Like, what you know, is it going to look at us and just you know know what we're thinking and then do that? Like, what the heck is going on? Mm. Yeah, this podcast come full circle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're, back, we're back again. We're back to AI again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Im imagine if it gets to the point where, let's say, you build a distribution center, uh, you build the first, then you program the robots, and then you build this another distribution center with the same sort of parameters, and it can kind of almost copy what the first one did, but customize for the second distribution center. Mm -hmm. it, it there like there is a lot a lot of really interesting potential mm. for like this you know this technology that's the digital version of giving him a high vis vest and calling him a supervisor and he just <laughs> teaches his <laughs> <name>. <laughs> yeah, basically. Mm. there you have it ai developing or creating games just by watching mm. bananas yeah Another four thumbs up from yep. everyone by the sounds of it. Yep. Professional <laughs> opinion. There you go. Professional opinion. <laughs> um, our last topic of the day now. Um, this one was pretty cool. I think it doesn't matter if you're, you know, heavily involved in the tech world or just tech things in general. It doesn't really matter. It sort of hit everyone. Um, and that was the spacex shuttle launch that we had yes. um i thought it was absolutely amazing i i kind of started following it i was checking everyone's gram i was seeing what elon was doing <laughs> where was he um and then we had that issue where the weather delayed the the first launch which i believe was meant to be on the thursday i can't remember yeah i yeah. got up early for, to be disappointed yep and then <laughs> it sort of got it got pushed back to the weekend and luckily that all went ahead really well um, but in, in between that period of being initially cancelled and then pushed to the weekend, I saw an article pop up and it was saying that uh, SpaceX shuttle had exploded. And I was like, no way, that can't be the same one. No way. I looked into it and apparently it was a, a practice run at a different facility. So I think the, the media kind of... You know, they love it. Don't they, they love that they sort love of it. thing. <laughs> um, that would have got a lot of clicks on that one. Clickbait, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, yeah, they. It was cool seeing the astronauts walk out to the to the shuttle and get all set up, and you know, they were everyone was quite emotional, and then everything went through smoothly, and they shot off into space, and it was awesome. I got up early to watch it with my son. He thought it was awesome too, um, and just seeing the whole process, and then actually seeing them dock at the space station, and it was like, yeah. We literally just saw guys shoot from here all the way yeah. to the space station, mm. and now they're there. It's mm. it's insane. Yeah. Like what a what a huge feat for manned like this era, new era of manned space flight. Like, exactly, mm. it's it's amazing. Like I've always wanted to be one of those ones that that go into space. You know, you see, yep. like, I know Richard Branson had done some bits and bobs, and mm. the way that you kind of see, com like uh, the way that I would love to see this kind of commercialized way i'd love to go up in space before i die yeah that is mm. that is one of those things that i'd love and whether it's going to cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> to do it i would love to say that i have seen that and, yeah and bef before i die i think that'd mm. be amazing and even know. seeing the videos of you know previous launches where before i saw this i would look at a like a rocket ship and think man that looks like 
the peak of technology. It looks amazing. And then when you compare that to what Elon and SpaceX had created, mm. it looks like how did that even yeah. make it into space, you know? Yeah. Um, There's a really good documentary on, I think it's Disney Plus actually about this, uh, about SpaceX. Um, I highly recommend people check it out if you also like to watch Disney cartoons. <laughs> 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 if you've got Disney Plus, I think it's on there. It's really, really good. Yeah. And just seeing like how Elon's mind works, like he got quite a bit emotional when, you know, they successfully launched and then when they managed to get to the space station and then he immediately started talking about, well, you know, it's time to make this happen more often. Like, how can we speed this up? Um, how can we take things to the next level? And he sort of spoke about how he wants this to be the bridge between getting humans from Earth to Mars and trying to, you know, populate or get people to Mars as well. Like, just the way his mind works is, mm. it's, it's amazing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the first, this was always going to be the first big hurdle. And yeah. then... Once you get past this, then it's... All bets are off. <laughs> I nearly said the sky's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you had to do it, so I wasn't the only one. Jeez. <laughs> I didn't want to take uh, take Ty's jokes away from him. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, anything anything is possible now. Yeah. I know you've got something on your mind, Ellie. I can see it ticking over. <laughs> um it's it's uh, it's really really nice to see the commercial uh, the commercialization of you know space yeah. travel yeah. because to you know obviously it began the space race um we had the apollo missions um but since then w you know we've only seen nation states do it where then you heard little bits about richard branson w with um, virgin galactic now you've got origin blue space um um, SpaceX. It's I. I'm. I'm really, really excited about the potential. Yeah. Because you know, Sp SpaceX has not been around that long, and look where they are now. So it's amazing where they, where they could potentially be in ten years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any final thoughts on that one, guys? Thank you for having me. <laughs> 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 well that would probably wrap it up for us for today's episode um thank you once again steve for coming along it has been awesome to have someone of your mental capacity join our <laughs> our, our crew <laughs> oh, 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 I've, I've got that on recording <laughs> the man the man with all the answers no it's been awesome um <laughs> we will do this again not next week but the week after um, and we will have a lot more to talk about. And hopefully we will have all of you guys with us to watch again.